uh, for joining us today. This is our third event for Career Day. Um, I don't know what students think, but I, I am really glad with this event. Um, they're not only entertaining as a colleague, but also it's a, it's a learning curve for the students and for us. I mean, I've, I've seen some work that I hadn't seen in faculty that I know for many years. So, so I think these are, you know, these are, these are interesting um, events where we can see, you know, the span of the work from really an early moment. And also we're using this, uh, David and Sean, in order to, uh, in a way to, to show the students that are now at that moment of the beginning of their thesis project of, you know, of how relevant it is, the work that they do now, but it doesn't mean that it has to be a finished work. Um, I think that each architect is presenting their thesis or their final project in different ways, but sometimes there's a seed or a small concept that happens right now, um, not a fully um, uh, realized um, proposal. So, and sometimes they could be really small um, and sometimes larger, but I think that it's, uh, it's interesting to see those career paths or career art. And we have another thing that is interesting is that we had our first in this, this is number three, and we also have another SIA grad. So we had Matthew, then Ramiro, and now David. So uh, here's Eric. Hi, Eric. Thanks for joining us. Um, so, you know, we have three students that have been on your shoes. Um, students, sorry, David. I, I see you so young still. Um, I, my career arc compared to, uh, is going to be like, a, it's more of a hop than an arc. What, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Sean, Sean was like, what well, he said, 2018, you know, so he went from 2018 to 2020, so. Oh, I see. Okay. There's always yeah. shorter arcs. But nevertheless, you know, they are quite relevant. Um, and I would say sometimes even more, more, more current than other arcs. Right, um, right. So, um, yeah, there's Sean Cooper uh, who presented his thesis from, I don't know, a few, few years ago. So, you know, I think that was the most recent one. Um, I'll be going back a little bit further than that. <laughs> so... <laughs> We want, you know how Maybe to name the year. before most were born, yeah. <laughs> you know how to say the year, you just can't show the work. No, years um, are important. So, um, so yeah, so thank you again, you know, um, and, and this is the idea is that we just do 10 minutes each. Uh, so it's fast. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, we have Q&A, you know, we can have a conversation, we can have some uh, kind of Q&A from the students um, and, and things like that. So. So Sean, I think that you're number one. Thank you. Okay. Well, so you, great. you can you can share screen and fire this recording. I will. I will. Um, thanks, Francia. I think this is a great idea. I'm going to try to talk about drawing and the influence of drawing in in my work and of course our work with Margaret. I think it's fantastic that Margaret will do another presentation. We already negotiated like the projects would show at the end, so they wouldn't overlap. Um, and so I don't have my thesis project, unfortunately. I have it in no, in no uh, reproducible form, but I have a drawing that I did as a student in my undergrad. And I think it's representative of a lot of things. And I wanna start with that. And then I'm gonna take you through some other drawings I did. And then finally a project that we finished. I'm gonna really try to make it in 10 minutes. So let's see if I can share screen. And we'll do this, we'll share, and then we will do, okay, is that in proper full screen mode for everybody? Yes, we see a, a black screen. Is that okay? Or you had an image here? There's an image there. Yeah, I think right now we see. No, okay. I see or... binder2.pdf and then a big black screen. Sorry. <laughs> That's weird. Let me try it again. Let's do this. Yeah, on my, uh, yeah. Yeah, there, there we see it. Thank you see you. an image? Okay, great. All right, uh, this is a book that was published in the early 90s. Uh, he, this was a professor of mine, Leon Sat Satkowski, a historian. 
And in, I think it was 1984, 1985, I was in uh, my fourth or fifth year of undergraduate and I was a work study student uh, making a little money as basically a kind of draftsman. So uh, he needed drawings uh, drawn of Vasari's work of which there were, um, you know, just some kind of stale copies. And so it was a, a, a kind of redraw, uh, in this case, of, of one of his uh, church domes. And somehow I cannot advance my slides. There, you see that image? Um, this is uh, actual drawings that I did that are, that are in the book. You know, first was a kind of plan and a, and a section. I should mention that, um, uh, and then the axon metric on the left, here's a more, a more detailed. So these are ink drawings. These are hand done as overlays. Um, they would sit on my desk uh, uh, and I'd take them out of the drawer and he would come over and give me a critique and I, I, I would draw them up. Um, and, and the reason I show it is this time in our education, um, this was uh, a school run by Werner Seligman, who was one of the Texas Rangers uh, with Slutsky, Colin Rowe, uh, and Haydick. Uh, and, you know, to sum it up, I would say they defined the contemporary as an analysis and critique of historical models. So we were educated to do things like this, which were to interrogate through drawing, uh, and then later critically in our design work, uh, uh, how architecture related to precedent. Um, this was a very uh, uh, interesting time in architecture. So this is like 85, 86, postmodernism is waning, uh, and new characters are coming into the field. At that moment, um, Upon graduation, I decided to immediately go to postgrad uh, and to continue uh, my education. In a way, I was critiquing the way we had been educated and was looking for something else. I didn't know quite what it was. So I went to Columbia University in 1986, uh, where I uh, met uh, the Morphosis uh, guys, Tom and Michael. Uh, Eric was teaching there, Eric Moss, and also Zaha Hadid, all uh, in early part of their careers in, in different times. Uh, and, and I think what I, uh, I was immediately attracted to the West Coast, Los Angeles. It was, um, to me, an alternative to what I saw as a very stale and dogmatic uh, dialogue and, and discourse on the East Coast. That's how I looked at it. Uh, you have to understand at Syracuse, uh, I remember someone having a Frank Gehry book on their desk and a teacher saying, get rid of that. You know, don't, you know, it was like it was banned. It was, it was really odd. So, of course, when you're a student and someone tells you not, you can't look at something, you are, of course, attracted to it immediately. Um, and so uh, I landed uh, in the offices of, of Tom and Michael in 1987. Uh, and there, I think the idea of drawing took on a, a different turn. And I would call it, and this is a drawing I did, one of the first things I did in 1988. Um, I would say it was a questioning of what constitutes architecture in terms of sources, but also it was drawing beyond drawings. That a drawing could be not only descriptive, of, of a thing, but it could also be uh, content in itself. And I think uh, much of the work in that office has revolved around this, and you're all pretty familiar with it. Um, oddly then, uh, for me, I had always wanted to build. I'd always wanted to, to manifest projects. And after a few frustrating years in that office where we weren't able to build much, we kind of had a turn in around 1993 where we won a competition, which was a high school, and then in 1996 for uh, an office building in Austria, which was then the better part of that decade. Me designing uh, with Tom and team of really talented people and manifesting these two projects. This is the first computer comes into the office in 1993. Uh, we're working in Form Z and other kind of crude programs. Uh, uh, translating complexity into build form and, and using those tools. Uh, but then, then uh, in 2000, uh, Margaret and I decided to, to join forces and work together. And so that's been the last 20 years uh, of our work. Here's a kind of menagerie of some of the projects uh, that we've worked on. Um, 
we also share, I think, uh, a need to build, to manifest what we make into the built world. Um, and back to ways of drawing. So I'm just going to show you a series of drawings of different projects we have. Uh, the use of exonometric to interrogate space, uh, movement, sequence, and a kind of choreography, if you will, of form, line, and mass. Uh, and then I'll end. These are just different projects we've worked on. And finally, one that uh, just happens to be uh, under construction now, uh, a house that is very much about a kind of movement in the center, this L-shaped, very straightforward in some ways project, uh, which uh, I think Christy looked at it the other day. She said, oh, it's this thick crochet project, which uh, you'll see portions of in this dealing with mass and line and the kind of choreography of the entrance here. Uh, and the ways of drawing that try to explore that, eke that out, more kind of traditional modeling. Okay, there's the render. And then the thing, this is just a few weeks ago. There's Margaret kicking ass uh, with the contractors on the right. Uh, a little bit of what goes into, I described it the other day, taking straight things and making them bend when they don't want to. Uh, there may be, this relates back to the drawing you saw, this piece. And so here, um, which it's always wonderful to do these kinds of exercises. I don't, I, this isn't a packaged lecture, but it seemed to me there's something from 1985 and drawings that I was doing and some of our work on the right. I would just put that forward to you. And I think, I'm under my 10 minutes. Yes, you have Hard one minute 40. Hard to do 35 40. years, 35 oh, years and 10 minutes. It's not so easy. That was amazing, John. <laughs> amazing. You even got a quote from, from Christy. So, you know, complete. This is complete. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, uh, let's see. We use your minute now. Let me stop. Um, Okay, so I, 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 don't, I don't, let me see who's next. It's Eric. Okay. So Eric, you can, you know, thank you for joining us and you can share your screen. Sure. You want. Uh, okay, I want to show you guys a few, uh, the, in order to get to the beginning and the end, there might be a couple of little bits in between, but I'll have to redo the screen share each time. And I put, I put the, the timer. Yeah, don't worry, I can go, I can talk at any, length of time, I can go 17 hours if you need, or 10, 10 minutes. Um, okay, so. You'll know. This, is a, this one will be a little bit of a story about how I went from being a kind of uh, pure history theory guy into uh, the kind of um, uh, career I do now of uh, crossing between um, kind of organizing of projects and other people's work in, uh, as uh, kind of an administrative role alongside my teaching. And so uh, let me show you where that story starts. Um, the, uh, come on, Zoom, don't let me down. Where is, uh, ah, here we go. Um, right, too many, sorry, this tip, classic Zoom problem is too many um, things open at once. Uh, I know, and now it's like making me freak out that my, my minutes, my seconds are, are, are ticking away. Um, you can use a time that Sean didn't use. Uh -huh. One minute. Uh, seed, so look, here's, here's a fun one for you. So, uh, oops, what did I just do? Something by accident. Um, the, uh, so traditional modernism in German architecture and urban design, 1888 to 1918, uh, a dissertation presented by me. Uh, to the PhD program, uh, blah, 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 Harvard University, May 2008. So what you see here is uh, that there's the thesis uh, question. Um, and here's mine, um, all 308 pages of it, the um, 147 illustrations and the endless footnotes and whatnot. I actually had to um, get a new computer over the course of this because I couldn't save a big enough PDF to manipulate all of these images uh, at the same time. 
they were still require you to print this on on cotton paper uh, to be put physically into the archives back in 2008. Um, but so this was um, a project that uh, that kind of summed up my education. It was my third PhD program uh, after I quit the first two uh, halfway in. Um, I'd been a geographer, cultural landscape geographer and started teaching that at University of Wisconsin-Madison and then I've been a history of art uh, person at Harvard for a while, studying architecture through that kind of lens and realized that I hated it. And so I switched over to the School of Architecture uh, to finish up. And so uh, I went to Berlin for five years to, to kind of write this dissertation. And while there, while working on this kind of history of urban form and the way that kind of all the branches of design were, as they were splitting apart, you know, industrial design, furniture design, graphic design, typographical design, and architecture, um, and many others. That that um, that there was a moment when I could understand a kind of taking shape of the contemporary city before what we called modernism had happened. That seemed to me of critical importance. But what was happening at the same time is hanging out in Berlin, I realized with some friends that there was no discussion among the many people in many different departments of the universities there who were working on these kind of questions, nowhere for them to talk. And so um, we started a group for them called the um, Berlin Forum for Architektur und uh, Urbanistik, and so, or for architecture and urbanism. And so uh, we've got about 300 uh, architects, uh, PhD students, young professors, uh, and so forth to join and to just basically take turns presenting their work to one another. And so we started, we were, uh, three, all three of us who were organizing that uh, got affiliated with the, uh, the new Center for Metropolitan Studies that was between the Technical University of Berlin and the Freie Universität and uh, Columbia. And we were all fellows in various ways there and we organized a kind of major exhibition out of that. But this was all happening at the same time as writing this story, realizing that telling these kind of stories and um, and getting that kind of um, uh, conversation rolling was something that mattered more to me or as much to me as the, my own version of that. And I would say that led to other projects, which I'll just show very, very quickly. Um, something like, um, here's one for you. Um, the, uh, I'll just do this one. I was going to show you a book chapter from a book called Architecture. Oh, of course, it's because it's not. Um, it is over here, I believe. Um, I just had opened this on top of it. So here's the architecture of industry from uh, Rutledge and Ashgate. And, um, and in this book, uh, I wrote the first uh, chapter of content, which was about uh, crossing from post-industrial spaces of production. I don't know if you guys can see that there. Um, post-industrial spaces of production, the new Brooklyn economy, and the Deutsche Werk. I kind of realized that uh, the stuff that I'd been studying from about 100 years ago was absolutely exploding all around me. That uh, my, um, my soon-to-be wife and I were uh, getting very involved with a bunch of things that were happening in Brooklyn at that time. And we realized that some of the stories of what could be contemporary design culture and making culture of making many kinds of things down to, from whiskey to architecture, um, that there were common threads that had echoes in the histories that we tell more exclusively for the kind of official story of architecture's origins. And so uh, starting to trace that led to relationships with major developers. I, a, I did a studio where we, ta uh, we worked on uh, doing 200,000 square feet of what, what was becoming the, the central um, new food incubator space of uh, the East Coast at the, Fis the old Pfizer company headquarters. Uh, we did a lot of projects with, uh, with actors on the ground who were, um, who were working on altering the urban fabric through this uh, new transformation. And it came straight, for me, straight out of the scholarly work of looking at kind of endless German sentences written in 1897. Um, and so then finally, uh, I'll give you just an instance. We could, I gave you instances of like what, what I do um, today at SciArc that, uh, that absolutely crossed in this. We have a book project going that's very much in this. We've been working on some land use policy that to, for me makes sense as, a, as um, a kind of 
expansion piece from this. But this is maybe a, a step in between when I was working as a professor at Pratt Institute, where um, where we went from that kind of like scholarly approach and crossing through architecture into the kind of acting on the contemporary city. Here's how uh, we did it then through publications. This is an, my old journal, uh, TARP uh, Architecture Manual. And here uh, through this issue was called Insidious Urbanism. And you can see uh, Vito Conchi, uh, Maria Ilova from, um, from Terraform One, uh, Ibla from Harvard, uh, so we had artists, we had journalists, we had um, uh, people from, from maybe 10 different countries with Portugal, Mexico City. We had people going to on, on the ground in Detroit and showing what was happening there. Francois Rush writing a maddening piece that had nothing to do with anything. And, uh, and so uh, that kind of uh, chance to take a kind of personal project and turn it into a platform where we could share personal projects together that might amount to something more interesting than what any one person's project might be. Uh, that became uh, kind of critical for me and maybe is what led me to become uh, the coordinator of research at, uh, at SciArc. Like I, I, I find it uh, to be one of the, the most interesting and, and exciting things that we can do to try to act and, and move the needle in the city um, to kind of bring together all of, all of this work, to figure out who's the right cast of characters to make something actually uh, a meaningful story. And so, um, this old uh, uh, journal issue from 2011 uh, would just be an early instance for me of having gone down that road instead of being kind of a classic scholar of architecture. And that is the end of my presentation. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, uh, I, I, I was hoping you were not going to read your 500 pages, I'm sure. <laughs> Could that be available to us? Can we read that or no? Can, can we put that yeah, PDF it's, somewhere? It's, it's out there. Yeah, we, it's, it's, uh... Maybe, but maybe, I mean, not that we're going to, you know, students might, might, might be a source for, you know, in our, like, um, in our library. So maybe Faris, let's email Eric and, and, and get that PDF if it's not too big and we'll put it uh, so it's available for students to see. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so, David, yes. or, you know, you still have the extra minute because he's like 24 no seconds. No pressure. I, <laughs> that's, uh -oh. You guys went so fast. Uh -oh. I think uh -oh. that we just, so we, we, the idea is that we have time for the conversation and, you know, yeah. generally we go over an hour, we go an hour and a half, so, so we can always keep it at our time. So, yeah, thank you. So. Okay, uh, I will go for it. Let me share here. Um, okay, so I have a big white screen. <laughs> um, thanks for having me. Um, I was, oh wait, does it? There we go. I was thinking, um, uh, as preparing for this a little bit, I've had, um, I've been reflecting a lot in the last few weeks about what I value in architecture and how that's come to be. And I think I, I thought today would be um, good as I was thinking through my quote unquote career. I wanted to kind of um, start uh, a little bit earlier than when I left SciArc, but even in my undergrad um, uh, with a, a, something that I noticed about how I've been taught and what I've noticed so far. And it has to do with um, like uh, the role of art uh, in, in, um, in the humanity of like the form of the social and the form of the intellectual um, uh, in the sense that uh, a lot of how I've been taught uh, in architecture and um, continue to think this day has always been to think of let's say the intellectual practice of art is somehow uh, a separate from the role of art in like the social world. Um, and I use here just like two, these are not obviously, I wish this was my work, not my work. Um, I use uh, Durer's Melancholia as a kind of uh, stand in for, for the idea of art and intellect is somehow removed necessarily from acting in the world that one studies the world um, and produces abstract thought. Um, compared to maybe a Carrie James Marshall painting uh, in the studio where the studio itself is part of the social world um, and the creation of art um, and intellect uh, is somehow in that same space. For me, um, I started my education at Carnegie Mellon um, and I did a five-year B arc there and these are just some images from that where um, this idea of, of the intellectual uh, form of architecture and the architecture out in the world was always set up as an opposition 
uh, for me. So there would be like studios where we would sort of fully be designing things and studios where we would be kind of going out in the communities um, and talking to people and not worrying about aesthetics or design at all. On the left, I include a project um, that I worked on for a few years after uh, my undergrad, um, this kind of subway station is in Pittsburgh. Um, the firm uh, that I was working for is actually SciArc grads, which is one of the reasons I decided to come to SciArc. Um, and on the right is um, one of the studios that I was in um, as an undergraduate where we go to this community and kind of um, work with people. The, 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 the feeling that I had at the end of this was that there was something about these community engagement meetings um, from my point of view that felt very paternalistic and disingenuous um, that we would go into these communities, hear from people, and then often the work that would come out would have nothing to do with, with that. And also that we couldn't really address the, the questions and the problems that people were, were putting in front of us. Um, this is kind of built on like a new urbanism model, which if you know much about the new urbanists sort of reproduce the same model every time they do work, but they always do these community engagement meetings. And it seemed to me more important to think about the, the sort of intellectual role of design and aesthetics, uh, which is what led me um, to come to SciArc. But this opposition is something I want to return to later because it's something that I want to, in my own space today, kind of want to move past in a way. So this is, uh, this is my, my little thesis pin up uh, at the end of thesis. Some of you probably on this call remember this uh, or may not, I don't know. Um, uh, as we all know, this is like the standard shot when we are in the building of, um, of how we produce these things, um, produce our theses. For me, the, the moment at SciArc uh, that I entered was very, um, it was a moment of what I felt to me as a student, a moment of transformation moving from um, what had seemed to be a pretty prominent uh, digital project uh, in, in some way and starting to ask questions of that project in, in particular. Um, so the thesis sort of did, it wasn't a design thesis. It was like very particular to be more of like a conceptual discussion about um, a certain elements of our working space. I was interested in, um, um, let's say the scale of like digital models and things like this. Um, and I'm working in, in series and producing series of plans, series of models, et cetera, as a way to, to make the conversation about the relationship between the things rather than the things themselves. Um, so just for some context, some of the work that was happening at SciArc in this moment um, uh, uh, were, let's say, um, Andrew Atwood's um, show uh, in the gallery was happening the same summer. Um, first office is Peak on Peak had just won that competition. Every, some of you I know remember uh, Jonah, who is um, a friend of mine who was teaching here, um, asking questions of the role or the abuse of history in, in design. Um, and the year prior was, uh, was uh, Aaron Bessler's thesis, Low Fidelity, which I thought was a, a pretty important moment in sort of asking certain questions of, um, of translation in um, kind of these digital moments. And so I was sort of in this kind of, uh, there was a lot of other things going on in SciArc, uh, not just all this black and white boring stuff. Um, but uh, this was like important to me to sort of be a part of this conversation about the nature of, um, of looking more closely about how we work uh, today uh, and, and um, the kinds of discussions that we can produce. So, you know, like these are some other images of some of the things I was making where these, um, these like forms that at the time were more about like the proportions of things, I was calling them paperweights, there were these useless objects. Um, they were always displayed on these stacks of paper. I think I spent more money on stacks of newsprint paper than I did on 3D prints <laughs> somehow. Uh, uh, they were always some, somehow like displayed on these things. Um, when you made a form, made, made these forms, um, the 3D printer obviously has a certain logic of how it creates, constructs forms. So uh, I was looking at like the way that a 3D printer makes a plan of a form and sort of constructs the structure for the model, uh, making drawings then of uh, the things that the 3D printer would construct. Um, we're also similarly looking at what a detail of something would, of, like this would look like. How do we produce digital materiality? How do we measure? Um, and let's say construct uh, certain things that could operate at different scales. So we could imagine some of these have certain references in them that sort of imply that they could be models that were one to one or one to 1000 or uh, one to 10, et cetera, uh, depending on it. Um, after SciArc, um, I uh, decided to uh, apply for teaching fellowships 
Um, and I did two of them, <laughs> one after one another. I did one at um, Ohio State uh, one year, and then the next year I went over to Michigan. And I wanted to just talk about what fellowships are, just because I know some of you perhaps might be interested in a career path like that. Um, uh, so basically, you, um, you have an opportunity in the fellowships to go teach somewhere. Uh, usually they're a year, some of them are two years. Um, develop some of your own research and and teach like I guess um, and it sort of gives you so, a sort of space to think of your thesis as somehow something that can extend and so when I did my thesis because it wasn't a design project I really did think of it as the beginning of at the time I thought a five-year project and um, for me the fellowships were important to sort of um, let that those questions that I started to explore um, during my SARC thesis uh, kind of linger on and, and develop a little bit further. So these are some slides. When you go to, to interview for these things, you walk in, there's like uh, 50 people of like faculty and students sitting there and uh, you did not expect that necessarily. And you have to kind of present and it's a pretty thorough job interview. Uh, as I remember it, Christy was there so she can, she can remember at least the Ohio State one. Um, uh, so one of the things you do is you teach. Um, this is some of the work that my students did over those two years. Um, you know, I was working in both core studios, vertical studios, um, and kind of some drawing classes I was asked to, to do. Um, the work was, as I look at it now, is a little bit all, all over the place, but uh, I think at the time, um, some of it was really kind of asking students to take on some of the questions I was interested in in the thesis and some of it was more, um, let's say, asking students to uh, reconsider issues of like urbanism and, and figuration. Um, this is also a moment that if you're interested in academia, you can start to produce, let's say, a writing practice and a publishing practice. Um, so during the, this is some of, I think this is for, I think I, there were a few more things I published during that time. Um, moments to like just write and have the time to write, to go to uh, conferences. The Expanding Periphery was the conference that David Rue co-hosted a few years back. Um, probably, uh, uh, this is like a yearly conference, but uh, that year that was the theme. Um, it allows you to somehow uh, be a part of all these things. Um, and then the last thing that you, at least uh, in these two fellowships that you do is a kind of installation at the end of the, of the year, um, some sort of either a, exhibition of work you've been working on all year, or um, in my case, thinking of the gallery as a site for um, an actual project. So um, on the left was uh, these this gallery that I filled with these large objects at Ohio State. On the right um, was more of an exhibition of a lot of like different paper models and digital models of paper um, that I put on display um, when I was at the University of Michigan. Um, oh, and you give a, <laughs> you give a lecture uh, as part of your final thing. That's the last thing you do. And I can't watch myself speak because I get distracted by my hands. Uh, it turns out I have a lot of hand movements. Um, but I think, you know, if anyone is interested, there's a lot of these um, fellowships and uh, there's been a number of SIRC alums that have done them. Um, obviously, University of Michigan and Ohio State were the two that I was a part of. Um, currently, Viola Agos at Rice, she also did a Michigan fellowship. Um, uh, Maya Alam will be talking to Hernan this summer for the Hernan chats um, recently completed the one at Syracuse. Um, these are, I think they're a really great opportunity. There's a flip side to them, which I think, you know, sometimes these universities have these as a cheap way to bring in talent and then it's not clear what you do after them. So they, they have a, a tough role. Um, or it's sort of tough sometimes for, for junior people, especially as there's been a proliferation of these fellowships everywhere. Um, it's also, I think, just can, being on the other side of seeing these interviews, there tends to be more male applicants for these things. I think perhaps it's hard to convince everyone to go spend a year, usually in the Midwest. Um, uh, and uh, it has tended to be most of these applicants kind of skew one way. So I would encourage all people um, who want to go spend a year and go do some experimentation if they're interested in teaching to go do that. Um, and lastly, this is something we're working on in the, in the office right now. So it's kind of super work in progress screenshot. Um, we're working on a, on a project, sort of a proposal for public bathhouses that could go around um, Los Angeles city owned lots. Um, these are two references at the top. Things I've been in kind of cure, interested in recently is about, um, let's say, questions of scale that started in, in thesis, but um, 
uh, in this sculpture by Robert Gober in particular, I've always been interested in this kind of um, the figure of different kinds of bodies put together at the same time, the different kind of materialities are present. Um, the sculpture is a one-to-one -one, um, a sculpture to the body, but all of the paper effects are scaled up. So it's a, a ambiguous as to what scale exactly it is. And it's also kind of has these ambiguities of gender um, that I've always been interested in and materials. And on the right are these um, patents for these like shower bidet combinations that I've been kind of fascinated by. Um, let's say reimagining the way that one cleans themselves, um, both in a social setting and also uh, in the kind of infrastructure of just the shower. So we've been doing these like tests of just like dripping water on paper um, and then these kind of gravity um, explorations as we've been doing lately. These are, I, again, the very rough screenshots um, that I took this morning as I'm working on some plans and sections of the project we're, we're currently doing. Um, the idea is that uh, the smaller building on the left is um, uh, all of the thickness of it are these kind of inflatable um, water uh, things that they would use um, to store water, but they're kind of rubber and, and malleable, and the whole building would be covered in them. So all the water uh, that you use for the bathhouse, the steam, etc., would come from that. And on the right, um, the pool is like on the second floor in this kind of caved-in area, and its kind of uh, water filtration system exists uh, on the roof. <clears throat> um, and so this literally, these are just like render tests that we're making right now of like how um, how the structure works, how the the piping works, where does it, you know, like where is the heating pads gonna go? And frankly, we haven't figured that out. And like, how is the plumbing gonna attach to the, to this like water things that are inside this poche? Um, we're working out these like details for this window. If you have like the soft material, um, how do you get a, a hard glass window to kind of go in there and even designing, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but designing like the hardware that you would need to kind of make that work. And then this like funny material that we would need to kind of absorb some water. Um, so I, the, I, this is my last slide, but I think the, the main thing that we're starting, I'm starting to kind of think about in this project in particular is how, um, how we can take on this question of like, uh, not just intellectual pursuits that my work has mostly been um, interested in, the conceptual kind of how do we draw, et cetera. Um, but I wanna, uh, moving forward and po possibly in this project, take on this question of the social and like how do, um, people interacting together in bathing spaces or in um, cleaning spaces or in society uh, influence our work too. So I don't know, today was more of just a putting it out there that I'm thinking about how to change my own work based on, especially on like recent events um, as I was reflecting back on, on my own education. But yeah, that's it for me. Thank you so much. That was great. And I appreciate the list of, you know, reference for the student. I did a print screen. I might have if missed not, some. I'm not sure, but yeah. It's okay. I mean, they can Google what's now, but I think it's a, you know, I mean, each student can think about a career path and maybe for the world today, maybe fellowships might be a great, um, you know, continuing research. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, and it's so. Who was your thesis advisor? I think. Uh, uh, Anna. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I should have said that. Anna. Anna, uh -huh. my, our lovely friend, um, was my thesis advisor, and now uh, my colleague. Yeah. Okay. But a number Thanks. of you were my teachers. I mean, Marson uh, was definitely my teacher. Elena. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting other people, but I, a lot of people. Yeah, it was great. Thank you for having me back. By the way, <laughs> I'm still here. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so I'd like to open the floor <laughs> for the screen to any questions. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit to kind of set up a, a conversation, you know, questions to any one of the speakers. I'm going to put it on gallery view myself. I recommend everybody to do that. Um, so also you can set up a, chat, a question on the chat. Again, my coworkers are really loud. Guys. Um, so please ask your questions. Richard, do you want to ask the question? You want me to read it or you want to ask the question? Maybe you can ask the question. No? Richard, where are you? Yeah, I see you there. Oh, my, okay, so I'm going to read it, okay. In Richard's voice. You have a little bit of a Spanish accent, but never mind. Never mind. Uh, thank you for all these presentations. I'm increasingly 
interested in mentions of periods of struggle or periods of waiting in careers. It's been common in these talks to briefly mention these periods that were between times of production and investigation. <clears throat> For Sean Enright, you mentioned a period of time in your early career before Diamond Valley in which you were struggling to get work. Can you tell us more about what you did in those years, what you work on, investigated and built that led to uh, the two large scale projects that you spoke of. I think for yep. students that are graduating right now, it would be helpful to hear stories of what people have done to overcome times of struggle and are sent and start yep. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. In my career, there's been three pretty major recessions that I had different experiences in. The first was in um, the early 90s. Uh, the second was around 2000. And then, of course, the third, you guys remember in 2008 and seven. And then now, four, really. Um, it, it, look, uh, on one hand, yeah, it's, it's tough to get work. It's tough to, to, to get jobs. I think when one is working, um, it, it's, it can be a time of reflection. So I think as an architectural firm, it's an opportunity to refocus, to, to look at uh, other avenues, maybe smaller projects, um, other ways to pause in a way. When things are fast in an economy, it's almost too fast. If you have a lot of work, you're like chasing it, trying to get it done, and, and this is an exciting time. But, but if you can get through it, now I'm speaking of like a young architectural firm, of course, uh, 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 and then if you're looking for work to try to find yourself in, a, in, a, in an office that is in that period. So early years of Morphosis, we went through that. We went from, there was a point in, it was hard to think of now, in 1992, the office was four people uh, after having been 30. And then I remember it being very depressing and scary and, uh, you know, but then we just kept at it and tried to survive, tried to still be there. I remember I used to think most people, uh, other than someone like Tom Main, would have folded the office. He was bleeding money. There was a lot of pressure on his family. And he didn't. And then eventually we got more work. It was like slow. But if we weren't, you know, if you fold the office, then you're not there to get the call, you know? And so... That was pretty scary time. Margaret and I have had a couple moments like that in, in, in you know, 07, 08, et cetera. But, uh, from, but on the other hand, it is a time, it can be a time of reflection for young offices and for, and for young people too, to pause a little bit, to try to broaden, you know, what you can do in the meantime, like instead of like working for, you know, capital A architect, trying to be a project architect, et cetera look for all those different avenues. I've always felt SciArc was maybe better at that than other schools, at least in the sense of the definition of what design and architecture is being pretty broad. As I spoke about my undergraduate, it was super narrow. It was like a machine to make project architects for offices in Manhattan. I mean, that's what it was. And I mean, they were good at it, but it was like a very different era and different, different place. Say some words on this question for Richard as well in a in a different register. That uh, if you guys noticed what that dissertation that when I finally handed mine in was that was 2008, right when the economy was about to collapse. And what we saw, I was already adjuncting at um, Pratt at that point, but um, but I was because I just ran out of money to live in Berlin, and so I had to come back and start teaching somewhere while I tried to finish my dissertation. Well, uh, it wasn't obviously for hist all history theory people were were really uh, hustling for a couple of years because every every uh, faculty search was canceled, or virtually every one. Um, then what we started getting a backlog, so that people who had already had jobs were up against people who had, were coming out three years later who had been their students. People were getting like turned down for tenure at like uh, who had been your your professors, and then you'd be up against them on the job market. It was pretty brutal for a little while. And uh, in, for architects, it was just as bad. In New, uh, in New York, I remember, uh, we were just pouring graduates into, the, into a, a non-existent job pool for a couple of years, uh, where they too were up against their people who had graduated a couple of years ahead of them. And what, when I talk about that Brooklyn job project I was looking at, a lot of what I saw uh, was architects who made up ways to practice 
architecture or to practice other kinds of entrepreneurial things that we're using architectural strategies and tools. So like most of the new distilleries that were established when the prohibition anti-distilling law in New York was repealed were founded, at least one of the co-founders for, for three of the ones that I studied were architects. And one of them, all of the co-founders were architects. We'd see it with the, some of the most successful restaurants. Uh, a guy, one, he'd been working at Stephen Hall and did his M mark at Princeton, but he won um, his first architectural awards for designing his own restaurants. And so, uh, and his barber shops and his clothing line and his, uh, and there were so many of these others. I remember uh, firms like um, Interborough Partners became the darlings of urban design in New York. At the time, they had no commissions, so they just started making up clients in order to do jobs for those clients, which was just sort of a collection of some neighborhood group, uh, the local uh, like representative to the city council and a couple of businesses they talked into letting them do stuff. And it worked. Like five years later, that firm was put in charge of like better part of a billion dollars of infrastructure work in New York. Uh, they're all professors now at various institutions. And I can think of lots of people who had to get creative at that time, maybe ended up practicing in a way that would have been different from what they thought. But I think uh, in, in many instances, they probably ended up doing uh, crazy things that they never expected that made their, their careers richer than they might have been otherwise. And it was, it was because of that moment of being forced to get inventive, both within architecture and alongside it, that we saw, uh, we saw a lot of kind of new solutions uh, put on the table. So Richard says, thank you. Thank you, guys. Oh, a question for David. Sorry. Um, because my, uh, I'm also looking into my thesis for sort of hygienic infrastructure. So I'm kind of interested how you view the role of the architect, if it's more of like a social engineer or a more of a wellness curator, like what the sort of balance is for somebody who's designing, but also kind of instilling like societal uh, like habits. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, that's a very good question, Sam. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you know, like, I think that the, the, well, I, like, I can speak maybe for the bathhouse more particularly, which um, we've been kind of been talking to some people in like various uh, groups in LA. And there's, let's say, typically in LA, when you hear bathhouse, you think a certain kind of bathhouse perhaps like maybe one that has to do with like an underground um queer sexual culture um but its history as we probably all know is like much broader than that um I, and uh let's say there's in that sense that kind of bathhouse is like private it's hidden its interior is removed and therefore you know the architecture actually has a lot to do with like whether people know what's going on inside or even know that it is a bathhouse uh, or something like this. Um, but uh, I, I think like the, the sense of like a community space um, that people, where people's bodies are somehow like engaged in that space is something we don't really see, we don't have a lot of in the United States at least. We have it perhaps in, in other cultures. I don't know, I mean, in terms of the architects role in it, I think we've, I've just been interested in like, how do we, maybe rethink a little bit about like, um, yeah, like how the, how the infrastructure of the building would even like be adaptable or reused. We're thinking of like the materials just get wet and then you replace them um, and you're just left with like a frame structure. So like the whole thing would be kind of, I guess, removable. I, I, I don't think this answers your question, but I, you know, like um, my sense with like some of that stuff, what I like about those like uh, old showers is that there's just like pipes. <laughs> the rest of the stuff is sort of like scaffolding around it. And I think that there's something about that kind of um, perhaps like that honesty of just like whatever it's doing, that's uh, a little bit retrograde, but also um, a place for me to start thinking about where like, does, where does design sort of fit back into that? Um, like having those things kind of just be open and pretty straightforward. Thanks. Okay, so I'm just going to mention, so also we have it in the recorder, so Fat, 
Fatima, she's staying in Bath House in Iran, was also a place for socializing. Um, I'm sure that's the reference that you're talking about, that this is the historical, um, you know, case study as well as it could be adapted to contemporary setting. Um, Rad, Rad, you want to say or you want me to read it? Um, okay, I'll read it. Uh, thank you for all the presentations. I have a question for David. You spoke about why you continue your thesis into fellowship, but how did you choose which fellowship you wanted to interview for? Do you think that some universities help their fellows post fellowship rather than using the term as cheap new talent? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the first to answer the second question, I, I you know, I, uh, I know that I was a bit dismissive, but I, they're amazing things, opportunities. Um, and a lot of people use them as stepping stones to broader academic careers. Um, it's just, there's a lot of fellowships now and there's only so many jobs after and kind of gets to maybe some of Eric's points earlier, but um, so, you know, the, sometimes the career path afterwards is not always clear. Some people go back into practice. Um, they, they just move to the Midwest or wherever for a year and then, you know, go back to the coast, uh, et cetera. Um, if, what was the, choose which fellowships? Well, um, I, there were a few that I think there's there's different things that you get out of them. I think um, I was looking at schools that um, you know I, I thought of as maybe uh, peer institutions in some way to start. So like Ohio State, um, you know, has a bunch of really great architects, uh, and we've had students from Ohio State um, and theorists that are some you know sometimes visitors uh, at Syrac, and same thing with University of Michigan. Um, and honestly, you also you know you have to interview and apply and so you get a job where you can where you can get one um but i think that the i i definitely didn't want to do those fellowships just anywhere i was mostly interested in going somewhere where i already knew um people there that i i was interested in, in getting to know and working with and um you know there's also a difference in like you know i think michigan has uh everyone knows those fellowships um in the u.s at least like there there's just so many people that have done them um, and they have a lot of money, so they're always flying people in and out of that school. So in one year that you're there, you've just met um, so many people from all over, at least American academia. Um, at Ohio State, it was it was more of um, kind of being just around more like-minded people that I thought were um, super intelligent and exciting, and it was just like a pleasure to be there. Um, but it's a good question. I think schools just like choosing um, a graduate school or just different places to be. Thank you, David. Uh, I have a question for John. Um, looking at some of the photographs that you were showing of what I think is the Rahmatullah house that's under construction right now. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned was how Griffin Android Architects takes straight things and manipulates them to, to bend and do things that they don't want to. And I'm, I'm curious as to what the decision process is uh, to have materials do the things that they don't want to versus sort of respecting their truth and their inherent properties or the grain of the wood. Yeah. Well, um, maybe maybe they don't want to, or they uh, uh, maybe I'm, I. I I understand your interpretation of that. That's interesting. I think anything we build, depending on what we're building out of, has its different challenges. So the stick frame house, you know, is a really American kind of phenomenon having to do with the price of wood, basically. Um, uh, and, and I think our work, um, you know, is is in that because it's a house, right? So you, in, in that case, um, there are other materials that would lend themselves probably better for form making, but less for economy. So I always feel like sometimes the state of the level of construction of residential architecture is very low, actually, but our work has a very high level of precision. So maybe it's more of a battle of means and methods. I mean, wood can bend and steel can bend and things can be pretty easily kind of formed, but it's a very 
difficult struggle to build things of certain complexity. It's difficult to communicate. It's difficult to build. And I guess certainly in my career, I've been lucky enough. Well, there's first an interest in a kind of complexity at a lot of different levels, but that I've had the opportunity to be able to try to figure those things out at different, whether this is work from years ago or with our own work, which is kind of setting yourself up. Like, it's interesting when David's showing his project, which I really like the last project, which, you know, I can't help but look at things like that. And he's talking about the plumbing and I'm already trying in my mind, David, like wanting to talk to you about it. And like, I have ideas like can the plumbing be structural and like all this stuff. Cause I find that stuff super exciting. Like, and it's super hard because he's like, he's got a formal agenda that's rubbing against like economy. And if it's a serious project, like they're going to be like, what does it cost? And you're gonna be like, I don't know. <laughs> you know like, and so I don't know, figuring that stuff out though is super challenging. And I think that's where experience matters in architecture. Like that's what's so hard. Like school can only get you so far with the technical. You have to challenge yourself outside of it and start to build your career as a series of moments of challenges with that, if you're interested in it. There are others that would say, would, would take the more of a, of a critique of that and say, that's all hogwash. It's everything should be much simpler and, you know, different and th th that might be okay. We, we definitely, you know, make our own bed in a case, in this case, like these challenges are self-made that, that we're doing. But I think I think the results at least have some kind of novelty or some kind of development of a distinct language, which I think we're we're aiming for. I hope that answers your your question, Sadi. I don't know if it does or not. Thank you. So we're closing our mark of 2 p.m. I don't know if there's any further questions from the students as they move on to meet their advisors next. Um, I can recite any other questions that you might have. Um, if not, I'm just going to give some closing comments. Um, so thank you so much, you know, uh, Sean, David, and Eric. I think it was, you know, it. I, I, I thought that today also was interesting to see three stages in a way, three models of uh, of a practice. Um, because I think Eric, I see your your model as a practice. You know, like almost as if you work as a as a as a theorist historian, but you know, like you think urbanistically, I mean, almost you think materially about the things that, that you, you work on. Um, and I thought that that, that way of, of looking at the past to think forward, I think that what you find 100 years ago, um, you know, if you imagine that the, what, what is called the, the Spanish flu of uh, 1920, um, it's literally 100 years ago. And so you you know you could you could start to find some parallels about what happened to the world, what happened to architecture, what happened to um, you know um, to people. Uh, so I I'm just saying like you know those kind of those stages uh, of the world. So and 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 again I I think that for everybody that haven't looked at uh, some of those earlier projects that Sean was talking about uh, from morphosis. Yeah, no lesson starts just now. <laughs> so, um, so you have some music in the background. Um, so, so anyway, so I, I saw that. Thank you for uh, pointing out those those drawings, Sean, and how they start to, to connect. Um, and David, of course, I think that yeah, plumbing is the next step. <laughs> you have a review with with Sean after after this. I wanted to. I mean, I I saw a documentary yesterday about. Italian uh, design from the 60s and the role of softness um, in flatables and polyurethane. Um, so, and how, who was the first one that did an inflatable beyond the um, cop him and blow um, or beyond, um, uh, you know, any of the kind of 60s firm? It was this guy. I did the first inflatable. So I think I'll send you the link. Yeah, send me. I want to. You know, there's something about softness. And polyurethane in the 60s was this new thing, and then 
they were they were um, um, there were so many complaints in the in the nineties and two thousands uh, about the use of plastic. So plastic had a role earlier on, and then it mm -hmm. didn't. So I, mm -hmm. I just it remind me to your work. So thank you everybody, um, and uh, you know thank you for your presentations and and everybody's participation. Until next career day. Thanks for yeah. inviting us. Thank you. Nice to oh see my everybody. God. Yeah, these are so fun when it's thanks. not your day to present. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so thanks, guys. Thanks for exactly. listening. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, Margaret is next week, I think. So we'll see uh, Barbie. Right. Counterpoint. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Bye, Thank everyone. You.